Welcome to Social Innovation, the Kaleidoscope, created by the Cambridge Center for Social Innovation. We share the different colors and facets of social innovation around the world. I'm Berenice Pardo. Hello, everyone. We're here again at, a, at an episode of the Kaleidoscope. And today with me is uh, Bernard Van Furen from African Origin Oils. So to start this conversation, I'd like you to tell us a bit about the family farm you have, where it is, and the problematic that it faces. Although I live in the UK and have done now for 22 years or so, uh, I grew up on a small, in a small farming community in the northwest province of South Africa. Four hours west of Johannesburg is uh, actually got very close uh, to the border with Botswana is where this farm is. And it was about 10 years ago that just as I was finishing my PhD in, in biochemistry that I was uh, visiting the farm. Um, uh, the farm is facing some real or was at the time facing some real challenges. When I was younger, it was a, a, a maize and sunflower and, and peanut producing farm. But uh, as the climate has been changing and that became quite uh, serious in around 2009, the farm was suffering an extended drought. And it was around then that this product that we're working with started to enter our lives. Uh, it was this, this melon that grows wild on the farm where my uncle and my grandfather are located and in the absence of any other plants growing uh, these other plants were really struggling to grow and this melon is indigenous to that region it was taking over it was growing it was growing wild like crazy um, and so we 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 took a closer look at it and and discovered that it contained this very special cosmetic oil was your biochemistry background the thing that made you that made you go ah let's take a look at this seed or how how did it came to the idea of taking a closer look to this melon that is actually if i'm not mistaken considered or it was before you started working with it considered a weed that's absolutely correct. So I wouldn't say that my um, I mean my my background in science I guess definitely led to some sort of a curiosity that I had. My my scientific training was not in uh, in oils, it was in actually in blood, uh, so the chemistry of blood. But of course there's a an underlying understanding of some of the uh, you know the basic uh, scientific principles and and my uncle knowing that I was doing this PhD in chemistry he was actually the one that reached out to me um, that was around the time that the argon oil boom was really just just about taking off and as they were exploring alternative crops because the the traditional crops were failing so much somebody suggested to him to he, he was asking about this crop and somebody suggested why don't you look to see if it has an oil in he took a melon, he took the seed out of the melon and he sort of clasped it or, or, or squeezed it with a, just a pair of pliers. And as he dabbed it on a kitchen towel, he could see that there were these oily stains. So yes, I mean, given that I was the, uh, that I was somebody in the family that, that obviously he knew and I, he knew what I was, was, was up to, he reached out to, to see if I could help him investigate the scientific properties of the plant. And, and how long did this research period last for you? It's still going on. <laughs> Never ending. Yeah, so, <laughs> so this, uh, th I think this conversation with my uncle was yeah, back in 2011. And at the time, like I said, I was finishing my PhD. So my priorities were definitely there. There was nothing, you know, these days, if you learn something new, you Google it. And back then, if you Googled Kalahari melon oil, there was really nothing. There was maybe one or two pages, very niche, very almost like botanists who were specializing in this, uh, this type of craft of, of uh, just identifying wild plants. So it was very slow. The first few years, we, we would basically seek advice from from other 
people who seem to have a, a, a bit of a basic knowledge about the plant. We would look at argan oil, we would look at baobab or marula oil, we would look at some of these other ingredients in the market and we would compare our oil to those oils. But it probably wasn't until 20, I think 14 or 15 that we were confident that we had a very good product. But even then, there, it wasn't known in the market. We, but thankfully, we knew that the product was good. It, it, now it became a challenge of convincing people of what we knew. How did you create the demand for, for this oil? So that's really challenging. And I mean, I'm not going to claim that we were the very first people ever to produce this oil or the only people to produce this oil. There were certainly, um, there, there was people doing this in Namibia, I think as early as 2008. That's only something we learned about in the last couple of years. We didn't know about that when we were, when we were doing it. It feels like one of those things where in, in various I suppose scientific endeavors, there were people working on the same problem at the same time, but maybe they didn't know about each other. And that was certainly the case for us. Um, but I, what I would say that sets us apart a bit is I think that we've done more um, to actually develop the market for this ingredient than most other people. I think we realized early on that, yes, we can produce this ingredient, but if nobody is going to actually buy it, it's not going to it's not going to be sustainable. We're not going to have anything. We're not going to have a business. And it's interesting because the cosmetics market or the skincare market, the hair care market, they're always looking for new and exciting, innovative ideas or products. But actually, they can be very hesitant when you first reach out to them and you tell them about a new ingredient. They're very skeptical. I think a lot of people have had experiences in the market where they've taken a risk they've tried something new and then the supply chain has fallen over for some reason or another, or the quality wasn't consistent or there, yeah, there was some issue. So we kept coming up against these types of challenges. So for us, we focused a lot on safety of the product, efficacy of the product and getting the regulationary or the, the regulatory paperwork exactly in order. So that took a really long time because again, we were coming from a position of not really knowing the market. Parallel to knowing your product, the properties, the benefits, etc., quite well, uh, I think your story is quite impressive in the sense of the problematic that it can solve for the region, for the environment, and and for the community. Can you um, explain a little bit of how you are approaching um, these challenges that that the region faces? Yeah, so this is something that maybe came a little bit after the realization about the, the quality of the product. And of course, it's very intimate to us because we were the ones experiencing it. It was, you know, my grandfather, my uncle, who were really uh, genuinely suffering on their farm as a result of this drought. And not just them, you know, the community next door, lots of the farmers that they knew ended up leaving or, you know, losing their farms and leaving for cities and things. So... For us, we were really experiencing that. But it was really when we started realizing how good this ingredient was, and we started saying, okay, well, if this ingredient can, or if this oil can replace some of the supply in the market, the argan oil or marula oil, or some of the other oils at the moment um, supplies, we can make an incredible, really an incredible impact in this very remote part of the world, which is being acutely impacted by climate change. And it was, I think that realization, that moment where we thought, okay, well, we have this great product and we can make it in a part of the world which is suffering from extended drought, where people are losing their jobs, where farms are becoming totally, um, uh, fallow and unproductive that we realize, you know, we're not competing with forests. We're not competing with other food crops. So we can bring value to a part of the world, which really has no other ways of driving an economy. You have been living in the UK for a long time. And um, at which point um, did you uh, find out 
about Cambridge Social Ventures and how was your uh, process with them? It was actually my wife that found them and suggested that we apply. And honestly, it was a, I think it was a moment in our development that really crystallized a lot of thing and re, uh, things and really helped us to structure our our work it was it was a really fantastic experience so when we first started working with the oil i've already mentioned i was still doing my my phd at the time after that i joined a bank in london and started you know, a career in finance uh and it wasn't until i think 2014 that i on the side with my uncle started promoting this ingredient but i was working just in my spare time and weekends and obviously the progress was quite slow because i i'm not able to put that many hours into into the promotion but we eventually got to a stage in 2017 where we were selling quite a bit of oil and it was the moment that i thought okay well maybe i can take this on full time and i did so in 2018 i quit my job and pursued the, the African Origin Oils Kalahari Melon project full time. And I really struggled with the lack of structure. I really, really struggled. And I, I was a bit lost knowing what to do or how to work or how to move the project forward. So when Olga and my wife found this social venture incubator i mean we, we had for a while understood the social impact potential of our of our project but we didn't quite know how to formalize it or how to talk about it or how to communicate about it so that was one that that was our reason for joining to get some help in in terms of structuring that side of our business but as a an added benefit it was actually the the it, it provided us with the structure that i in particular needed to to work actually to to work effectively because i was procrastinating and wasting a lot of time without it were you part of the cohort with with cambridge social ventures or was it um get your your business started was it a workshop or the whole cohort? no we were the, we were the full cohort so we were in the spring 2020 uh intake and how do you think that being in touch with so many um social venturers uh, with so many different backgrounds uh, impacted the, the way you're working now? So that was, a, that was another added benefit actually of the cohort, uh, which I didn't mention, but I said earlier how I started my career in finance. And although there were some people who were already in the philanthropy or the ESG investing space, it's not maybe the place where you've you build a, a network of, of social ventures, of course. So we didn't really know that many people who were in a, in a similar boat to us or, or trying to achieve a similar thing to, to what we were doing. So all of a sudden we went from having maybe one or two contacts to having 30 and all people with similar problems, similar challenges, people who use similar language. And it's just really, I mean, it's, firstly, it's really helpful, but secondly, it's really encouraging when you have ultimately peers, people who are who, who have a, a common goal or a, or a common vision for the world, and all not working together because we all have similar business, uh, we all have different businesses, but sharing sharing a common ambition, the will to change the world. Exactly. <laughs> Oh, that sounds great. I wanted to go now to what you have done uh, with Olga on 2020. So you have gone from finding this incredible oil, creating and developing the market, to providing for, uh, for the cosmetics industry, and now you are venturing into a new world of another social venture. Uh, which is the own skincare company. Can you tell us a little bit about what you're doing? This ultimately came from many years of using 
the sample bottles that we had lying around for the wholesale business. So, you know, obviously I would send out samples to all of the prospective buyers who wanted them, some of our distributors. And just because we had the oil lying around in the house, I, I started using it, obviously, I mean, years ago now. And um, Olga, we could say she was maybe skeptical at first, but she, I think she very quickly found out that this oil could solve a lot of her skincare problems where other products with 20 or 50 ingredients couldn't you know think like dry skin or sunburn or or windburn um she increasingly decided to actually pick up the the wholesale oil sample bottle and use that on her skin so it, it was really I suppose, validation of the product, or, or we realized that, you know, the, the scientific research that we were doing on, on, on the ingredient for the wholesale business actually had real value when used just on its own. Perfect. I, I was just going to ask um, what you think that uh, will set um, you know, Sophia apart from the other cosmetic brands that uh, sell products with with this oil do you think it's this social impact it's a, it's a really good question i think authenticity is is at the heart of that answer but there's there's other things that flow from it so you know we are we are the we are the experts in this ingredient and and so anything we're going to formulate is going to have this ingredient at its heart but in terms of being different from other brands this goes back to our uh, our conversation about the Cambridge Social Venture um, incubator. And we really have a vision to build this brand, build this company in a way that adds as much value as close to the source of production as possible. So we control 100% of the supply chain of this ingredient from the we actually manage the seed bank ourselves we plant the seeds we harvest the melons we extract the seeds we press the oil we bottle the oil so all of that is controlled by us other companies in fact most companies all across the world they source their raw materials and they buy the the raw materials from south america or from africa or wherever it may be and then they do probably 99 or more percent of the value addition in France or the, the USA or in, in their home markets, which is the formulating, the mixing, the bottling, the labeling, all of those things is, is done away from where the ingredients were sourced. Our long-term vision is to bring as much of that as close to the source as possible, so much so that in five or in 10 or how many years it takes us years time, we want to be producing our products on the farm exactly where the oil is produced in the first place. It would close the loop of... <laughs> yeah, it, it just, it may, I mean, in terms of the, in terms of the, the loop or the, the sort of circular production, I mean, we are already recycling 100% of the waste that we generate on the farm on the farm we don't do offsetting we don't send anything anywhere else i mean our um our harvesting process is putting i think 96 percent or almost 96 percent of the organic matter that's harvested straight back onto the land so we actually only take about four percent of mass out of the ecosystem which is actually incredible if you think about it if you think about somebody harvesting beetroots or potatoes or maize or something the whole the whole point is to take as much biomass or as much organic matter out of the system because that's the thing that you're selling in our case the vast majority which is all the fruit and the the, the rinds of the melon which are which are bitter very bitter by the way they stay behind so they fertilize the soil it's food for the microorganisms that live there it's a really beautiful process. I'm really glad uh, that you're really motivated. One can see the spark in your face when you talk about it. And I really, really wish you the best. And thank you for joining us. No, no, and um, we'll continue to follow your story. 
And you can find more about the work of the Cambridge Center for Social Innovation by following our social media. See you next time.